Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Talking Sass. And as always, thank you guys so much for joining me. I appreciate it greatly. And you know what? I have another stellar guest lined up for you guys today. And he works for one of the biggest sports companies in the world. And he gives great advice in today's episode. But before we get there, let's talk about patreon.com slash sassy Steffi. Starting on only $2, you guys are going to get great exclusive content. And trust me, with this guest, especially if you're into broadcasting, this is an episode on my Patreon. You're not going to want to miss the extra five questions that I talk to him about. It's amazing. But if you're not into Patreon, that's totally cool because you can check me out on Instagram and Twitter. I love interacting with everybody. And also, I started a TikTok. That's right. I didn't think I'd ever be one of those people that started a TikTok, but here I am. So go find me. It is Talking Sass on TikTok. I'm having a lot of fun actually posting a lot of different things and seeing the likes and the views that I'm getting is just crazy. I love it. Anyway, <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell notification so you never miss a second of Talking Sass. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform or watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It is so important. I could tell you all about the algorithms and everything like that, but I'm not going to waste your time. It's free, it's easy, and it really benefits the show. So make sure you subscribe however you are listening. My podcast listeners, don't forget to rate and review Talking Sass with five stars. Now on to today's guest. I mean, some of you may remember him as Kyle Edwards on WWE, but he is so much bigger than what he was at WWE now. I mean, this man has worked across the board when it comes to sports and different television programs starting all the way in Toronto and making his way into New York and Connecticut. It's crazy. He's this, if you are a broadcaster wanting to break out, this is a great, great interview for you to listen to. He gives tons of great advice. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this. Anyway, my guest is Arda Okal. And I mean, he's done everything in wrestling. He's commentary. He's done commentary for table tennis, for hockey, for basketball, football. I mean, you name it. He's been a part of it and he is just awesome to talk to. I had such a great interview with him and I really think you guys are going to enjoy it. Plus, he's also my first Mensa member to ever be on Talking Sass. How cool is that? Well, I don't want to tell you guys anymore, so I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Here's Arda Okal. Hey guys, I am sitting here with the one and only Arda Okal. How are you doing, Arda? I'm great. How are you? It's nice to meet you. We we met briefly once you were telling me uh, mm -hmm. before, like in passing, but it's nice to finally sit and talk with you. Definitely. We're going to have some fun today because like I told you earlier, I have a whole bunch of research on you. <laughs> yes. I saw, you showed me the one page. Where I was like, oh my gosh. Like, yeah. And that's have some people like research stuff about you and it's like, oh, crazy. Yeah. And that's completely <laughs> toned down. So can you imagine like what if I had like unlimited time, what we would actually get to discuss and stuff? It would be crazy. Crazy. But before we do get started, one thing that I did find interesting, and I think you're the only person so far to be on my podcast that is a member of Mensa. Yes. I actually how have a pencil. That, Hold on. How does that happen? I don't know if you can see this, but this is an American Mensa pencil. I don't know if it's going to zoom properly. Yeah, I, you can kind of see it a little bit there. Yeah. There you go. Um, so first of all, it's like the most pompous thing ever, right? Oh, I'm part <laughs> of a member of Mensa people. Okay. Excuse yeah. me. I'm very over. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, okay. There's a trick to this. I actually uh, broke K Mensa kayfabe here uh, a few years <laughs> ago, and I wrote an article about it. Uh -huh. So. If you ever, so Mensa accepts any aptitude test that you've ever taken in your entire life. So even if you took one at, let's say like five years old and mm -hmm. you scored in like the top percentiles, that would qualify you to get into Mensa. Interesting. So it's not as difficult as you think it is. Now okay. I took a test when I was like 35 and honestly, it's, it's just like a, how do I explain it? It's honestly like a test you would give your kids. It's like, it's like 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 riddles and like stump questions you know what i mean like yeah. that's really what it is and like and like simple math it's not like you're doing calculus or something on the test do you know what i mean so yeah, like i just yeah like i just thought it would be some 
I'll tell you why I did it. Honestly, since this is a um, a wrestling themed podcast, I thought it would help me get over perception wise at WWE. That's why I did it. I did it while I was at WWE, and I was just like, "What can I do to stand out and to get some like na- uh, value around myself?" And I was like, "I wonder how hard it is to get into Mensa." And so I looked it up, and. I didn't have any old aptitude tests. So they're just like, well, you can take one now. And I did. And then I got accepted. You you have to cross a threshold. Like, it's not like a, you know what I mean? So like, it's not for people watching. It's not as difficult as you think it is. And honestly, if you go back to your tests, I bet you a lot of you watching right now will be like, oh yeah, when I was like four or five years old or whatever, I met the threshold. So I can join Mensa too. Like, it's not, it's, it's one of those things that like people put, emphasis on it a lot more than probably it is Uh, with that said with that said please treat me as if i'm the top one percent of the entire world (laughs) well it's funny because i've actually met other people who have told me they're mensa members and i'm like i honestly don't believe you but like you can't say that right that's because that's just rude but like you just look at your daily interactions (laughs) and you're just like how would anybody expect you to be in the top percentile of people who are extremely intelligent in the country. I don't understand. But now see, I, I know a little bit more it makes a little bit more sense because I think maybe they could do something like that. I'm not going to throw any names out there, but yeah, there, there are a few. Person, I'm, sure I'm glad that we were able to like, we basically started the Mensa dirt sheet is what we just did. there. <laughs> I've, totally I've become the Dave Meltzer of uh, Mensa now the where I'm like revealing all the secrets and I'm, you know, my sources tell me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's so awesome. You're going to have so many people becoming Mensa members in the, like the next, like, yeah. I don't know, like two weeks or so. <laughs> Why do we have such an influx of applications all of a sudden? Eh? Why are all these wrestling fans all of a sudden yeah. want to be Mensa members? <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I love it. I'm actually going to even try to do to it. About that. Do Crazy. It. All right. So let's flip it back because obviously you're a big sports guy. Mm -hmm. huge sports guy working Mm -hmm. for ESPN sports center and stuff like that now but let's take it back all the way when you were a kid were you playing a lot of sports because I know I read somewhere you're a big computer nerd you like video games wrestling and hockey but were you playing actually any of the sports yeah hockey I played hockey growing up and soccer growing up I probably went until college for hockey but I always knew I wasn't going to be an athlete and I was always like enamored by the people behind the microphone and honestly like my very first dream was to be a sports anchor like I I saw the people like the Ron McLeans of the world or the Jim Van Horns and Gino Reddas on TSN doing sports center and I thought that was the coolest job ever I just didn't know that it would be a job that I could get and as I was getting older like I always loved sports and I always loved pro wrestling growing up and as I got older I just I don't know why but I had it in my head maybe it's a confidence thing but I just had it in my head that I wouldn't be able to become a sports anchor I thought it was like too pristine or too uh, unattainable. Everyone was going for those jobs. And and this is not discounting wrestling in any way, shape or form. But like, I always felt like in order to be a wrestling and this is wrong now, by the way, but like at the time, this is what I thought. I always thought that in order to be a wrestling broadcaster, you had to know everything about wrestling. And I consumed so much wrestling in my childhood that I felt like I knew everything about wrestling especially Mm -hmm. the era in which I watched it, right? Like I grew up in the 80s and then into the 90s and the Attitude Era. So like, that's my sweet spot, right? Right. Everything from uh, Hogan becoming champion to the end of the Attitude Era was like really me watching it uh, and and consuming everything I could, right? So that, 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 for some reason, I had it in my head that like I would be, it would be attainable for me personally to become a wrestling broadcaster. And, And I did grow up like, I loved watching wrestling, but for me, it was the interviews and the promos that like really kept me coming back. And in particular, I found like Mean Gene fascinating and and Howard Finkel, how he would announce names and and Gorilla Monsoon, how he would commentate. And then later Jim Ross, it just opened like my, my whole world to a different style of commentary, right? So those were the jobs that I like really, and the people that I like idolized growing up because it's like, I want to be like them. Yeah. And I mean, the names that you mentioned are absolutely legendary. I mean, everybody knows who you're talking about, even like kids nowadays, like maybe not our kids age because they're a little young, but like, let's say 10, 15 years old, my niece and nephew's ages, 
they know those names, Mm -hmm. you know, because they are so legendary and just absolutely stand out in the sea of people who have been broadcasting within wrestling, you know? Exactly. And, and then hopefully they do forever more. I mean, they should, right? Like those those are Mount Rushmore type people. Of course, definitely would put most of those on my Mount Rushmore of broadcasting in WWE. So as you got older, you got into wrestling. And in 2008, you, you started, you basically did everything in wrestling except for bumping and refereeing, right? Uh Pretty much. (laughs) I I refereed one match and this was the one time. uh, So you had Jimmy Corderas on the show, who's one of my best friends. And like, he couldn't stop laughing. Like we were at squared circle training. I remember this. I forget who was in the match. I think Sebastian Suave was in the match and someone else, maybe Brent B, maybe Brent B. It might've been a Suave versus Brent B match. And they like, I was like, all right, guys, I'm reffing this. And they're like, yeah, okay, sure you are. And I'm like, yep, no, I'm in, let's go. And so like, I'm like doing my best, like referee, like, you know, moving around and Jimmy's like yelling at me, heckling me. He's like, where you're in the wrong position. Like get down for the count, stop being lazy. And like, they did this spot where <laughs> it's so funny. Brent, it's like lock up, uh, headlock takeover, pin, got to get down, one, two, kick out, up again. And then they wait for me to get up to my feet and then back to a pin again, one, two, <laughs> back up. I got to get back to my feet. They did that like 10 times. And I, by the fifth time, I'm like, I'm not going to count this. And Jimmy's <laughs> like, what kind of ref are you? You better get down for the count. And I'm like, oh, my God. I, at, at one point, I was going to do the old, was it the Bronco Lubitsch, like just hit, counting with your foot? Yeah. And then Jimmy's like, you can't do that. And it, was, it was just such a funny. Anyway, that was my ref story. My one and only match, I retired after that. But um, but yeah, it was, uh, when did I start in the indies? I want to say 2005 or 2006. Okay. It was just literally setting up chairs. Like how, how you would suggest anybody get into the independent scene is just volunteering. So I set up chairs, put up flyers, uh, and 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 then just went to the shows and soaked it all in. And then eventually they gave me a mic and said, do you want to do backstage interviews for the DVDs? And that's what I did. And started with uh, BSE at the time, Blood, Sweat, and Ears. Still the greatest name in indie wrestling history, obviously. Uh, and <laughs> what is it? you hear that, you're like, is that it? What kind of company is that? Yeah, it, <laughs> could, more be like a, it could be yeah. boxing. <laughs> uh, it could be a music company. It could be a touring company. We don't know. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, uh, but they were putting on great shows though. And they were getting a lot of like TNA talent at the time. And, you know, we brought in like Kurt Angle, uh, we brought in, uh, uh, Christian when he was like in between companies, like it was, we did a lot of cool stuff with that company. So it was, it was a cool indie to have in Toronto, but yeah, that that was the journey set up chairs, uh, pay your dues, et cetera, you know, like go put posters up, do, do the grunt work that a lot of people would want to do, help set up the ring, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually you just get little spots. Yeah, Exactly. I mean, you were an organizer, a promoter, a ring announcer, a commentator, an interviewer, a host. And you even, this is what I love with some of the charity work that you, that you did. In 2008 to 2014, you were an organizer and promoter for, I'm going to screw the name of the city up, but just bear with me for the time. Um, a Kalawit. The Kalawit, yeah. And you brought up, that's in the Canadian Arctic, for those who don't know, like it's, way way north canada and you brought in people like rhino christian tracy brooks christy hemi lance storm colt cabana and more i mean these places are not used to getting names like this caliber because i know there's people across canada that do the these village tours up north in different areas but they're normal independent workers but you're bringing actual names to this this city is i mean how did they receive that It was amazing. So Sebastian Suave has taken over essentially and still does that with Smash Wrestling, by the way. Shout out, cheap plug. I used to commentate (laughs) for Smash too. Uh, But anyway, uh, so those that show started in 2008. 2008 was a cool year. That was probably like my best promoting year. We did a cross Canada tour where we went from Toronto to uh, the edge of Saskatchewan, like the edge of Alberta, I guess, and then back. So we did like a whole loop. It was like 20,000 somewhere around 20,000 kilometers, maybe, maybe a little bit less, but definitely in the, over 10,000. It was somewhere between maybe 12 and 20. Anyway, there was like 16 stops. It was amazing. It was a great, it was a great experience. And, uh, and somehow, believe it or not, as an indie wrestling promoter, I didn't lose money. That's wow. Amazing. Amazing. I didn't make a lot of money. Like a lot of them were charity shows. So like, that's yeah. fair enough. But like, I didn't lose money. I didn't lose my shirt as they say, uh, which was amazing. I know. Right. So Ikalowit, 
uh, how that happened, honestly, there was a guy uh, named, uh, his, his name was Kyle. He worked in Iqaluit at, at the time. He was a big wrestling fan, and he reached out to us and said, how can we organize a show? And I said, well, here are the expenses, et cetera. The biggest expense was really the air, air, airfare, right? right? Like, so to give context to where Iqaluit is, it is in uh, uh, none of it, which is a, a, ter- a third territory in Canada. And it's a three-hour flight north from Ottawa. So look where Ottawa is, and that's a three-hour flight north. Like, that's how far it is uh, in, the nor- in the Canadian Arctic. Like, it is one of those places where you see the northern lights, and it is – you get 24-hour daylight in parts of the year and 24-hour uh, no sun for parts of the year as well. And we've seen both in our travels. And so – the important thing was, okay, so we, we worked with the airline. There was only two airlines that fly up there. We worked with the airline to get a, a, a better rate. And the reason was, um, was because we made it into a entire city focused event. It wasn't just, we're coming to do a wrestling show for profit. We didn't make any profit. It was mm-hmm. what, what it was, was a, we made sure to do as much, uh, promotional charity work as we could. So when we, that was half the thing. Like I, I didn't touch the wrestling part of it at all. I just said here guys, like whoever the wrestling people were, uh, go book the card, go get the names, whatever. I'm going to focus on the charitable part of it. So I booked appearances at every school for motivational talks. We even went into the, um, the, uh, the jail and did a talk there, the juvenile hall. Uh, we did a community event. Uh, we went to, any, any, anything that had any sort of good vibes and, and goodwill, we touched it. Like we were there, we did events, we helped out, we volunteered, we did a lot. And, and actually, I'm proud of that more than the actual shows. The shows themselves were amazing. Uh, they had a um, Winter Games Arena, an Arctic Winter Games Arena, and the maximum capacity was only like 800 or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it sold out both nights. And the second night, I'll never forget, like we booked it so that like day one was a tag match leading into we actually created an arctic championship which was kind of funny oh that's so much fun we just yeah we we gave the belt to sorry tyson earned the belt tyson dukes earned the belt uh we gave it to him and uh so he comes in arctic champ he's a heel whatever match uh one was a tag he wins challenges or sorry um baby face wins brent b challenges him to a match night two so it was a great match too like Brent is, I love Brent. Like if there's one guy I wish really had a chance in WWE, it's Brent B. I really do. Like he's so good. Anyway, I'm veering off path. That's okay. this. So, so Brent and Tyson have this great match. It was like, I don't know, a 20, 25 minute match and Brent wins. Crowd's like super invested. And I'll never forget the, the image of him grabs the belt, goes into the crowd and like the, the 800 people like just ran around and like created like a, like a semicircle around him. It was like Brent in the middle and just like fans like all around him and like looking at him like he's like their conquering hero and like he's holding the belt. Like I wish I could find that picture. It's like such an amazing moment. And like the fans were so invested in it. And I'm like looking at this and like you know how it is. Like you've been wrestling for a long time. You were in the bubble for a long time and you still are, right? Like sometimes you get jaded, right? Like sometimes it just like takes the wind out of you and you're just like, ah, like you know, the, where's the passion that I used to have when I was watching it, right? Like that moment brought it back for me. I was like, wow, like this is why I, I, lo- I loved this so much. This is why I want to do this so much, you know? So like, the, but, yeah, that tri- I, I will, like that trip was, those trips were amazing. Like they, I had so much fun. And those organic moments like that, that you're saying with Brent, those are like, you're like let's say you're going for a while and you're just like down in the dumps you're like why am I still doing this my body's killing me and then you have those moments and you're like this is why I do it just because it's it's amazing I've had a few of those myself and it's just like okay this is why I continue to do what I do I mean I love it obviously but you do you get jaded you get injured and you're like why do I put my body through this it's not easy. You're right. Especially as a worker, like it's not easy. You're taking bumps, taking a toll on your body. And like, people just don't understand. It's not like you have healthcare waiting for you either. If you get injured, right? Like there's so many factors that people just don't understand. And like, I admire, like, that's the one thing I miss about, like, I, I'll be honest. I haven't watched wrestling probably in five years now, since I left WWE. But the one thing I do miss and the one thing that I, that I keeps me in, at least like with a toe in the, in the wrestling space is 
I love hearing about people's like journeys, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially when they make it, you know, like, like I'll, I'll use the Bollywood boys as a great example. I know they just got released, but like, I I've been friends with them for, I don't know, over 10 years. So like, I remember us sitting when I worked in Vancouver for the weather network, I remember us sitting many a dinner, just sitting down, just talking wrestling. Like, here's what I've been doing this week. Here's who I've been reaching out to. Here's this person, you know, like strategizing the path to get to WWE. And like, I, I love that stuff to me like that, because I want people who are like, they, you'd be hard pressed to find two people more passionate about pro wrestling than them. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's very, there, there's an elite level of person that exists that loves pro wrestling so much that that is their plan a b and c and those two fall in that category right so like when they made it it was like such a joy for someone like me who saw this journey firsthand for several years spanning a, over a decade right and so when mm -hmm. they finally were able to announce that i know how much it meant to them it's like you get goosebumps and you tear up because you're just like this is amazing like this is this is one of the best moments that they're ever going to have. Like just to make that announce, like that's, I had that moment, you mm -hmm. know, when I announced it and like, it, it was, if, if, if it just feels good when you see people like that. And that's, that's one thing that I still keep up with, like talking with people who are on their journeys and et cetera, you know, helping out however you can. Well, definitely. I mean, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is I want to help put some of my friends over, you know, get people out there that people might not know yet or, you know, we'll probably know in the future, like people, I want them to succeed. And like, I've had people ask me, like, why do you still watch wrestling? Like you didn't get to WWE, like you had extra spots and all this, but I mean, you didn't get there. I'm like, yeah, but so-and-so is my friend and they're there. And I was there for that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like the last time I did extra work for WWE, half the women there were my friends because I, I shared the locker room with them at Shimmer. And like, to go back there and see them and they're having the absolute time of their life, you know, living out their dream. It's amazing. And I'm like, I'm so proud. Like, yeah. you know, those are my friends. They're doing what they love, what they're passionate about. Yeah. So I didn't get there, but I also have a family now. I also have these things that life took me another direction and I'm okay with that, you know? It doesn't matter that I didn't make it there. I still live vicariously through my friends. So. I, exactly the same. And and I get this a lot. Like, look, I did make it there and I didn't make it there, right? Like my biggest success in pro wrestling was getting signed. Yeah. But beyond that, I did barely, like my biggest, if you were to ask me like, what was the coolest thing you did at WWE? It was creating a segment called This Week in History. It was, it, it was a pretty good on YouTube. Great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, me and me and Gravy, like basically, and, and honestly, the reason we did it was because we had so much, like at the time he was doing the Raw pre-show and we would sit there in the conference room all Monday, like eight hours. And like, we would just sit there, watch TV all day. And then we'd do the Raw pre-show at night. It was such a ridiculous shift. It was just, we just <laughs> sit there and just talk for all day, all day long. I'm not kidding. And so one day I was just like, why don't we just like do something? And he's like, yeah, what do you have in mind? And I'm like, I don't know. We both know our stuff. Like, why don't we just do like a this week in history kind of thing? And he's like, go pitch it, dude. I do it. And I'm like, fine. So then I did. And then it got greenlit. And then we started doing it. Like, it was just like such a random because we're in the building. We might as well do it. And he was like, yeah, I love this. It's great. But like that does that pales in comparison to like broadcasters that are on Raw and SmackDown or whatever. Right. But like people ask me, like, are you bitter? A hundred percent. No, I'm not bitter at all. I'm happy. It happened. I'm happy. It's over. I'm not, I don't regret anything. I really don't. I'm mm -hmm. very happy that I got there because now I can help others who are trying to get there. And I will say this, like in, in, in ideas of like helping others, maybe watching this, who want to get there, especially if they're a broadcaster, mm -hmm. there has never been a better time to work at WWE as a broadcaster or get in the door. I should say, there has never been the barrier to entry is lower than ever. And I'm not saying that because they're desperate. Absolutely not. Right. I'm saying I come from an era where it was very limited how many broadcasters they would use. And those jobs were very few and far between. Now you can work with them on a part time basis. That was unheard of for a broadcaster even five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now they have so many digital products that you can collaborate with them, and that is welcome. 
Like it's never been easier to pitch ideas to WWE and try and collaborate with them, especially when you compare it to five, 10, 15 years ago and what it was like to even try to become a broadcaster at WWE. So no, I'm not bitter at all. Uh, I am now at a point where I will happily give any advice uh, to anybody that, excuse me, is looking to get there because I know how to get there. My problem was just staying there. <laughs> really. Well, I mean, you were still there for a considerable amount of time. I mean, from 2014 to 2016, that's two years. I mean, I recently had on Alyssa Marino and she was only there for about six months or so because uh, COVID happened and NXT shows stopped happening. So, yeah, you know, see, that's it, unfortunate though. Like if yeah. that had not happened, I'm sure that Alyssa would still be there. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, I think I so. that's just an unfortunate circumstance, like an mm -hmm. unforeseen too. Like who would have predicted a pandemic? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> awful. But I mean, for two years, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the show with Corey Graves, but you also did WWE's bottom line, WWE experience in Europe. You did interviews for WWE.com, Raw pre-show, like you mentioned. And you also did five things on WWE's YouTube channel. I mean, you were doing a plethora of broadcasting while you were there in those two years. So funny thing about five things, they, they used to have a, uh, like, it was like a five, like a hand uh, mm -hmm. thing. And uh, apparently someone, I don't know who, uh, didn't like the hand anymore. So they're like, we can't have the hand logo anymore. It's done. We're gone. So that's why the logo changed. If you're ever curious why the five things logo changed suddenly, it's because <laughs> someone didn't like the lines on a hand or something. Thought the hand was too amateur. And so the hand got got future endeavored. But I can, I can well, was it Mae Young's hand that she gave birth to or was it just? <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Yes. Was it a different hand? <laughs> we'll go with Mae Young's hand because it's a funnier story. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But I mean, before you even got to WWE, I mean, you've been working in TV and broadcasting for so long. I mean, you originally, how a lot of people, especially here, got to know you in like Quebec, you were on Sportsnet and you were doing um, Aftermath TV, which was actually with Jimmy Corderas. And at one time, Soon, well, soon to be at that time, Renee Young, but uh, Renee Paquette at the time. So, I mean, you've been around with names within wrestling business and broadcasting and everything. To me, it seems like at that point in time, it was only a matter of time before WWE picked you up and started using you for all of the talents that you possess. So funny story about that. I'll, I'll give you my journey and fill in the gaps based on what okay. you just said there. Cause I think this might be useful for people watching who want to get into WWE uh, as a broadcaster too. So I always thought that the way to get to WWE was I need to know as much as I can about wrestling. Like I thought that that was my ticket. Like my knowledge was high. I knew a lot. I was a really good historian. I knew my, I knew my facts, et cetera. I had an audition in 2009. Now by then I was probably a little too green to have the audition, but I just kept knocking on the door, sending my tapes or my, my uh, emails, DVDs, whatever. And finally they just had an open casting call and they brought me in and I didn't do well. It was, I wasn't ready for it. Like it was a terrible audition. So they didn't call me back for four years. And in that time though, in 2009, that's when I pitched right after wrestling, which became aftermath. And that became uh, something in Canada, which w it had like a 10 year run, which is like unheard of, you know what I mean? And like any television show having 10 years is unbelievable. So like, I'm very, very proud of that. So, but um, until I left, uh, I, I left the score at in 2013, after the whole Rogers merger happened, you're laying off people uh, left and right. I still thought that that was the way to do it to just get as much wrestling knowledge. And that's why I was continuously doing the indies and I was still doing uh, Aftermath, et cetera. So one day uh, I had another audition while I was at the score and I didn't get the job. I did really good. I felt good about the audition because by then I had a lot of reps under me and I was very comfortable in front of the camera. And I had a, a hit, I mean, I'm not being conceited when I say this, but Aftermath was a hit show. Like the ratings were good yeah. and they were very happy with it. And uh, it was on the air. And they, in, in fact, by that point, they had increased it from one show to two shows a week because it was so successful, right? And that's a testament to the cast. Like Renee's a superstar and Jimmy was, uh, lended a lot of credibility because he had been with WWE for what, tw over 20 years, yeah, okay. uh, et cetera, right? And the, and the production staff was fantastic. Like it was a really, really well-oiled machine by, th by that point. So anyway, after I didn't get that job, um, I got a call from Michael Cole. And Michael Cole at that point had just assumed the role of all broadcast operations, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And so he called me and he literally like, this was like a, you know, like a, a, a straight on, like no BS. This is a truth meeting kind of thing. Okay. And he honestly said, look, if you want to work here, you need to stop doing wrestling. That was oh. literally his advice. He was like, go get experience elsewhere. Stop tweeting about wrestling. Stop creating wrestling content. We know your wrestling knowledge. Go get experience elsewhere. So at that point, I ended up getting a job with the Weather Network. And I worked with them for about a year, which was a great job. I worked in Ottawa first, and then I moved to Vancouver. Uh, and that was a full-time job. If I didn't get the job at WWE, I might still be in Vancouver today, honestly. It was such a wow. great city. Well, you did the morning show there, right? Exactly. And that, and honestly, that was one of the reasons because I wanted to see out this WWE goal that I had set for myself. <laughs> and then while I was in Vancouver, I had another audition and I nailed it. I, I knew everything to say. I was like super confident, not cocky, but very confident because by this point it was like number four. So I was like, I know what I'm doing. I go into people's offices now to say hello, like as if I'm like, you know, one of the one of the people that worked there already. Like I was just like uh, firing on all cylinders. And then finally, uh, I got offered a job. And one of the things that Cole said was, you know, people notice like people all the way up to like Hunter noticed that I stopped doing wrestling and took that advice. Wow. And so, yeah. So like, I guess one piece of advice that I would give out is when you hear something like that, especially from someone at WWE, do it. Cause it worked for me. Like I could have just as easily said, ah, I don't know. I'll still do my wrestling stuff and you know, I'll get picked up eventually. But I took the advice and I made the adjustments and it worked. It was noticed and I eventually got there. So like, it's, it's important to, you know, to, to listen, I guess is a, is a good way to put it, but also to take it to heart because he could have just been, you know, he could have just easily given me bad advice, but he didn't, he gave me the right thing to do. And I did it. And then all of a sudden I got a job. So. Well, one of your former coworkers down at Dragon Gate USA, Lenny, he told me that um, when he did the uh, WWE network special for um, Dragon Gate down there, not Dragon Gate. Um, Evolve. Yes, Evolve. Thank oh, you. Yeah. It was totally escaping my brain because I wasn't going in that direction at all. Yeah. Today. Um, when he did the WWE Evolve thing there, he's like, I was pitch, I was on going on all cylinders I, during the show. I'm having WWE executives texting me, telling me I'm doing great. He's like, and then I heard nothing else. He's like, but Michael Cole let me come down to like NXT and he would sit and talk to me and give me advice. So like, I know a lot of people vilify Michael Cole for whatever reason, I don't get it, but whatever reason, but like, it seems like everybody that I've talked to, he is trying to steer people in the right direction because he wants people to succeed just as much as anybody else. So, okay. I want to say two things about this. So first okay. of all, Michael Cole, I think that he gets compared to people who we have this like legendary opinion of, like mm -hmm. you can't compare Michael Cole to Jim Ross. Jim Ross is the best wrestling announcer of all time with apologies to Golden, Gordon Soley, but Michael Cole is the best sports entertainment announcer of all time. And, and I think that those two roles are very different. How are they different? I'm not saying Jim Ross can't do this. He did. He did it for 20 years. Mm. I'm saying Michael Cole is, 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 is a different breed of announcer. It's like the next iteration of announcer. Jim Ross is, is grandfathered in from a, from a, from a previous era right? Where, where things were a little bit different and the rules were a little different. Michael Cole is beholden to a much more strict set of rules as are the broadcasters today. And people don't understand how difficult those set of rules can be to a broadcaster, whether it's hearing people in your ear, whether it's remembering, remembering certain verbiage, whether it's trying to fit things in that normally feel like a square peg in a round hole naturally. And Michael Cole does that very, very well. And, and possibly the best that we'll ever see in our in our lifetime. Because well, that's another thing that Lenny said is exactly he's not there to be a sports entertainment broadcaster. He's there to direct traffic to WWE exactly. Network. He's there to direct traffic to the pay per view, to the next show, to this. He's like Go, his job is yeah. not to broadcast the matches. Let me let me let me put this out there. Mm -hmm. Go watch if you want to see Michael Cole at his like most loose or let's just like most fun. Go watch the, um, I think it was the Brock Lesnar in Japan 
event. It was a WWE Network event, and I think it was from like 2015. I remember because I gave him notes for this, and he used all of them. It was like the craziest thing. He's like, do you have any anything you can give me on this? And I gave him like 10 pages of notes, and he used like everything. It was really oh, funny. Amazing. Yeah, so like, but like, I could tell like he was just being himself. He didn't have much to throw to. He was just like chill Michael Cole calling wrestling. And mm. you watch that and you're like, wow, he is really good at calling mm. wrestling. Like the, the, you, you'll see what I mean if you watch that. But anyway, I wrote it uh, down. I'm going to check it yeah, out. Yeah. It's, it's a great show too. It's, it's, it's I think, he, I think Brock faced Kofi at that one. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in Japan, but anyway, you'll see Michael Cole is like, there's a different vibe to him there, especially in certain matches. Uh, I owe Lenny a thank you. I've, I've thanked him personally before, but I'll say it publicly too. So he was the reason I actually got my first shot with Dragon Gate. Mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't do a show and he suggested me to Gabe. And so Gabe then hired me to do a bunch of loops that Lenny couldn't do. So I basically became for a while the Evolve Dragon Gate fill-in guy. And some of my commentary might actually be on the network, which is hilarious. Uh, this is like the indie commentary. Yeah. So uh, that's all thanks to Lenny, uh, who is awesome. And he's the best. And whenever he's in town, we always make sure to, uh, to get together. But, yeah, he's, um, an, he's yeah, another big sports guy that I love just like shooting the breeze with. Obviously, yeah. when the Canadians and Tampa were playing, I was trying to keep my distance because oh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't do too hot. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, was, we're, yeah. we always have fun. Yeah. Making the finals was uh, quite the feat. Did you did you go to the Montreal Canadiens We Came in Second Place parade? I didn't, but I did go <laughs> to when um, Montreal was in Tampa playing. I went to the Bell Center two out of the three games to watch oh, wow. at the Bell Center. So we're watching, and you know they only let thirty five hundred fans in, of course. So it's like it's very, it was such a very unique, very different situation than I've ever been in in the Bell Center before because they're still very strict about a lot of the COVID protocol. Yeah. So like our section, we were center ice and in the reds. And so like we had to walk in a, behind a, like in the kitchen of a restaurant, go through there, get new masks, sanitize our hands and go through and then sanitize our hands again and then we're like, oh, okay, we want to go to this concession stand down here because we want whatever, smoked meat or something. They had one of the different um, concession stands. It wasn't just your typical hot dog and, you know, nachos. But we couldn't. We were in a bubble. So they would put uh. like three or four sections together in a bubble and you couldn't go anywhere else but in that bubble. Like it was so bizarre, but a lot wow. of fun still at the same time because, I mean, obviously, Stanley Cup playoff finals, you're like, Exactly. exactly. What <laughs> yeah. an experience. Yeah, it was. I mean, tickets here. I know Lenny, it was funny because he actually tweeted something along the lines like, oh, I want to go to the one of the games, but it was like $350 a ticket. And I was like, are you kidding me in Montreal? Because they've only let 3,500 fans in. Yeah, It's over $11,000 for a ticket. What? I was My like, Lord. $350. I would jump on that in a hot second. Like not even think about it twice. Oh, hundred percent. I know, man. What a di what a difference. <laughs> yeah, but Florida and Quebec, two totally different ideas on the COVID situation and how it was handled. So yeah, you know, neither here nor there. So let's talk more about wrestling because, like I said, I I've like gone off the rails here, totally away from all of my my uh, research that I did. But I mean, we talked about 2010 and 2012. You're doing Dragon Gate, and what I loved um, reading in 2013, this had to be such a great honor. You actually co-hosted the Northeast Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame with Howard Finkel. How was that working with the Fink? Oh, it was great. Uh, that was around the time that I, I tried to do every Hall of Fame ceremony, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fink has always been fantastic to me. He was one of the guys that I look forward to talking to while I was at WWE. We'd always, I'd always just go into his office and I never said hello to him. I always came in with like some <clears throat> some random trivia. <laughs> and he would always get right. I'd be like, uh, I, instead of like saying, hey, Fink, how's it going? I'd walk in it. <coughs> Sorry. No worries. I'm okay. I'm surviving. Someone's stuck in my throat. I'd walk in and I'd be like, hey, Fink, who was the, who was the Intercontinental Champion in November 1992? And then he'd be like, Shawn Michaels, good to see you. 
Like it's just really funny. <laughs> like just like he, he without missing a step. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so it was a thrill. Like I mean, I idolized him growing up. I, I, you know, I mean, the the funny thing is like anyone that grew up in that era that became a ring announcer at first, you were imitating Howard Finkel, right? Of course. So, uh, but yeah, the New York, uh, New England Hall of Fame, the uh, Cauliflower Alley. The um, uh, jo Luthes, George Tregas, uh, Dan Gable, uh, one in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, then there was the uh, Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame at the time. It was in, I think, Schenectady, New York. Mm -hmm. So there were there were a few like wrestling gatherings that had ceremonies that I just felt I, I figured at that time, you know what? I'm just gonna go to these and just meet a bunch of people. And there'd always be like maybe one or two WWE people, but like mostly it was just hearing the stories of like people during the territory days and you know like i was a mid carter in the territory days or i was a job guy a person in the in the territory days like tell me your stories you know like yeah sometimes you get the best excuse me sometimes you get the best stories from people who just live the life of a journey person wrestler right so yeah for I me know, i, I, I cherish to, those yeah i went to cac a couple of times and the first year i think it was i did a seminar and it was like how to get heat with Ted DiBiase and Harley Race. And I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever done in my entire life. Like these are two absolute freaking legends. Yeah. Telling yeah. me as a, I was maybe two or three years in the business at this time, telling me who is 90% of the time a heel, how to get heat. And I'm just, and me, I'm old school fan anyway. Like if you watch my wrestling, it's very sensational, Sherry inspired and, you know, to me, I was like, this is just amazing hearing them tell stories, hearing them how they put together a match and everything like I still have the notebook and everything. I mean, this is probably 10, 12 years ago now. And I'm just like, I still have that notebook and can go back to it and be like, they told these stories and told <laughs> to do A, B, C, D, E in a I match. And I love it. Were you there the year at Cauliflower Alley where they had a I think it was a 65 person battle royal. I don't think so. So that I I <laughs> I still laugh at this because I saw the sheet and I'm like, there's 65 names on this. And like someone, I think one of the bookers was like, Yeah, we just wanted everyone to have uh their their chance to have an entrance or something. I'm like, I respect that. Yeah. But like, how are you gonna keep a 65 person? Sorry, not man, 65 person battle royal interesting. Like, that's a lot of people in the ring. First of all, how are you going to have that many people in the ring? It's not going to collapse. It's going to hold, like, what, like, 40 people or something? Like, that's a lot of weight, right? Max. I would say 40 would be the max. Yeah. Absolute max, right? So, like, that's funny in itself. But, yeah, 65-person battle royal. Never before and never again. Yeah, I think WWE <laughs> only went up to 40 the one time, right? <laughs> so like, lame. The greatest, <laughs> the greatest battle royal or something. Please. <laughs> You clearly yeah, haven't been to the Gold Coast in Las Vegas <laughs> to see the 65-person Battle Royal. And it's so fun, too, because CAC, <laughs> they have those bowling tournaments. So you see all, of, like, these old-school wrestlers coming in, and they're just having the time of their life. I mean, some are playing cards in a corner. Others yes. are bowling in this tournament. Can it I tell you a funny story? So I, yeah, I was, um, so I, I like to play, like, the $5 blackjack tables. Mm -hmm just for fun. Like I'm not a gambler. Like it's just to pass the time. So I was, I think I was with Adam Pierce. I'm dropping names here. I apologize. So anyway, we sit down I'll that up for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, <laughs> so we sit down, uh, we see Harley race playing, uh, at a table. So we're like, you know what? We should just sit down with him. So we sit down at the table and he looks at me and he's like, well, if you're going to sit there, kid, you better put some money on the table. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm being coaxed into playing here. I'm not going to say no to Harley Race. He's going to beat me exactly. up. So I'm like, all right, here we go. Whatever. And it, was, it wasn't a $5 table. It was like a $20 table. It was like, this was like a table that was well beyond my comfort zone. So I'm like, I'm not going to be playing a lot here. So maybe like $40. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. going to accept this for this once in a lifetime opportunity to play blackjack with Harley Race. So I get, I get my cards uh, and I get 12. Okay. And the dealer's showing... Uh, I don't know, something, something that they would have to hit. So it comes, Harley gets like, I don't know, he's, he got like 20 or something. He stays. So it comes to me and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, Oh, I have 12. What do I do here? Like, I don't want to hit and bust. Dealer yeah. has to hit. I'm thinking about it maybe a little too long. And Harley looks at me and he goes, 
kid, you better hit that. <laughs> and I'm like, but, but look at the whole, and he's like, no, 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 you better hit that. And I'm like, all right, well, do what Harley Ray says. Get the card. It's a nine. I'm like, let's go, Harley. Yeah, <laughs> buddy. Let's go, 21. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> and, he, and he looks at me, he's like, I called you, kid. Just listen to me. <laughs> like, Good luck charm in Las Vegas, man. Right? <laughs> right? And I'm like, all right, I'll pack it up. Thank you very much. Let's go. See you later. It was just yeah. like Harley Race telling me what to do in blackjack is like <laughs> a cherished memory. <laughs> For sure. And I'm sure you have tons of those. Because I mean, like I said, you've been around the business forever. And then, I mean, not only that, like we, we kind of mentioned earlier, in 2016, you went to ESPN. So now you're living out your dreams with sports stars of all kinds of sports and levels. I mean, just looking at what you had wrote on your uh, personal website, MMA, wrestling, hockey, soccer, and even table tennis, you've yeah. done commentary for. Oh my Lord. That, that, those were the Rogers TV days where like, mm -hmm. I just tried to get experience in everything and anything I could. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. ESPN 2016. The first thing I did was esports. Actually, uh, we did a uh, event at Madison Square Garden. That this is crazy. So hmm. MSG, like you know, obviously the Rangers, the Knicks, uh, you know, great biggest sporting events. Muhammad Ali, whatever. Obviously WWE, pro wrestling, uh, etc. And now I'm there. The first time I get on ESPN, the first time I'm on Sports Center, is a report on a League of Legends World Tournament. So there's teams playing a video game, sold out two nights, <laughs> crazy scenes. It, it reminded me of pro wrestling a little bit. Like it was like, um, the fans were amazing. They brought signs, they dressed up, cosplay. It was a vibe, it was awesome. And that's where I got like, that's where I got hooked on esports. Like I was like, man, this is, first of all, these are my people, like I'm a nerd. So I'm like, these are yeah. my people, this is great. Uh, and then second of all, I was like, this is a growing industry. Like I want to be, I want to keep my eye on this. So for the next several years, including with ESPN, I did esports, uh, and then, uh, I, I, I transitioned from there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, that was a, a really fun time. And then I basically joined ESPN full-time in 2019. And just going back to what I was saying earlier about like, I, I, growing up, I didn't even think it was possible for someone like me to even think or or strive to be a sports broadcaster to do anything in hockey or to, to host sports center. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally did like recently, it was only a few months ago, maybe a couple months ago that I did my very first sports center and it was just surreal. Like I was just like, it was like such a goosebump. Like, I can't believe I'm actually doing this moment coming from that where I had, right. Like I felt yeah. confident in doing it based on the experience that I had. And, you know, I've had a blast doing them and I, and you know, more to come, but like that moment for me, it was like almost vindication for that kid that didn't think that it would ever be possible, you know? So it was just yeah. kind of like a cool for, full circle kind of moment. Yeah, you definitely kind of manifest your own destiny, just going about it in, you know, different ways with the way that you started within sports in the Rogers days and then going into, well, wrestling yeah. was around then too, but then going into Sportsnet and then coming to WWE and all the things you did behind the scenes too with wrestling. And then ESPN, it's like the, this is like pretty much any sports broadcaster or sports fan kind of dream just to even get to be a part of ESPN in any way. Yeah. And it, it has been a dream come true. And like everything I do, there's very fulfilling. I love the job. I love the people and, you know, hopefully uh, it, it's more to come and just only growing from here. Like, it's just such a, it's just great. Like, I feel very blessed, honestly. Like we were even talking about our families before we started recording, like just, mm -hmm like where I am in life now is just unbelievable. Like, you know, having a wife and a kid and living in New York state and, you know, being able to work at a place like ESPN and on an institution, like sports center is like one of America's most well-known programs. Mm -hmm. And I get to host it here and there. Like it's, that's so surreal to me as a Muslim Canadian kid that grew up super shy and overweight and, you know, love like what felt like a misfit felt like a, an outcast for much of his life. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. I don't know. It's just, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful. Like I'm just very grateful and very blessed. And sometimes it, 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 it feels surreal, but now I'm like, you know what? Like I'm, this is great. Like I, I, I relish it. I cherish it. And I, and now I built. 
That's amazing. Where do you think in say, let's say five years, I mean, you, you reach ESPN, which is pretty much the height of the mountain for a lot of people, but where do you see yourself going? More sports center shifts contributing to hockey, NHL and ESPN is coming up in the fall. Uh, and then I'll probably uh, join a wrestling school, learn to take some bumps uh, in my 40s, you know, do the Dave Batista route of becoming a WWE superstar, uh, probably headline a few WrestleManias. And then from there, parlay it into movies. Uh, you know, I'll do the mummy part for Haku Mashente. That'll be me. Uh, <laughs> I love in the it. Remake. And then, uh, you know, do a couple of Fast and Furious movies and then all of a sudden be the highest paid actor in the world. Uh, it'll probably take me 15 years, but I mean, who wouldn't want to see a 55 year old wrinkled and out of shape action star? Uh, you know what? If The Rock can do it, you most certainly can do it. John Cena <laughs> can do it. You can do it, too. I mean, we can't even see him, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh... So, Arda, to wrap it up before we get going. I want to talk about, obviously we mentioned the Canadians and I mentioned it to you before we went on air. Cause like these, like, I don't know why I stopped following you there for a bit. And then I found back and then it was like the playoffs happened. And I was like, Oh, you know, he's a Leafs fan. I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan, obviously the first round. And some of the stuff that you were doing online was just making me pop so huge. Cause like <laughs> I, I told you, obviously the video that you did where you're wearing like a, a, um, a Toronto Ma uh, Maple Leafs jacket and you're like, I can't believe they lost to the Canadians. This is a yeah. historic <laughs> rivalry. I, I, can't, I can't be a fan anymore. And you're about to take the jacket off and throw it in the garbage. And then you're like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't, I can't. And you, you take the jacket back. And then as you're walking away, you say, even the Cleveland Browns have won more games than the month that not the Montreal Canadiens, but the, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I popped so huge for this because me as a Canadians fan and a Cleveland Browns fan, yeah. I mean, just absolutely popped me to, to the moon on this one. <laughs> it's so funny because there's not very Montreal Canadian fans and Cleveland Browns fans yeah. out there, except for me and maybe Paul Byron. <laughs> so there's two people. That's basically it. So that, that <laughs> joke was for both of you. Uh, yeah, that shows Sports Nation and uh, it, they give uh, Sports Nation is great. I love the production team on that show. Uh, they give me a lot of leeway to do a lot of random stuff. Like I do a segment called OCAL News where I basically report on like video games or wrestling or NFT drops, you know, stuff like that. And then uh, I did, I pitched this after the Leafs lost. I thought, I said, I thought it'd be funny to like, see me like unravel as a fan uh, for a couple minutes and they were, they were into it. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, and then walking away, uh, even the Browns have won more in the playoffs than the Leafs have. It's like, but yeah. As, it as a Cleveland Browns fan, I totally relate to everything you say. Cause yeah. every <laughs> season I'm like, I'm just going to burn my Cleveland Browns stuff. And then this year it's like, holy man, we're doing really good. Let's go. Like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, we got to face the Chiefs and then it all went sideways. But nevertheless, I was like, this is the season like in my <clears throat> years of life, I've <laughs> never seen a successful Browns team like I saw this year. And I'm like, I've waited my whole entire adult life to see this. And we get this. Oh. And like, I'm really hoping this year we really push through and can make it even further to the Super Bowl this year. Knock on go. wood. Exactly. Knock on wood. We're knocking. <laughs> Do you have any Super Bowl uh, predictions for this year yet? I mean, I know preseason hasn't started quite yet, but you have a I mean, or anything? I mean, all eyes obviously are going to be on the Bucks and, and what Tom Brady does. We just saw the news that Tom Brady uh, played the – excuse me, the entire 2020 season with a, was a torn MCL, which is like unbelievable to say yeah. the least. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's hard to bet against him uh, at the start Absolutely. of a season, especially. But uh, I mean, listen, I would love to see much maligned franchises get their time in the sun, right? Like, like the whole Bills run was great because like yes. after the four Super Bowls in the 90s, they had like decades of futility, right? So like to see teams like that and obviously the Browns as well and even the Jets too, right? Like why not see, see I, what I'd love to see is I'd love to see new eras start mm -hmm. in these franchises or continue so that they can achieve the success that their fan base, especially for fans, like I relate to it as a Leafs fan. I never went away from the team, but like yeah. 
you know, they, they haven't had success. Like they've had regular season success. They haven't had playoff success. So like, I'd love seeing other teams like that. That's why I was like for the Euros as well, like seeing England make it to the final yeah. and won a World Cup since 1966 or a major tournament. They hadn't even made the final. It was like a very similar drought to the Leafs. So it's like to see them make it to the final was really cool for their fans too because, you know, there's a lot of fans that have been there a long time. So Super Bowl prediction, it'd be cool to see two teams that uh, have had uh, a recent history of sadness uh, get their chance in the sun. But then again, also you can't bet against the Chiefs because yeah. I hate to say it, I know, but Patrick Mahomes, like, you see those throws he was making in the Super Bowl? Like, come on. He was literally, like, parallel to the ground, and he's throwing, like, a 50-yarder or whatever it was. Like, that's Ridiculous. unbelievable. Don human. I don't understand. And that's what's, that's what's rough for the Browns this year is that's our first game of the regular season. And I was like, oh, that's going to be a tough first game. Very tough. <laughs> You know, when we get to the Steelers and Baltimore, obviously those are two big rivalries for us. But to have the Chiefs as the first game, it's gonna it's gonna be a hard season for the Browns. But honestly, with the draft picks that we had this year, a lot of the players remained healthy through the offseason and OBJ rehabbed his ACL completely. So I am like, I I am like beyond the moon happy with my Browns team before we even get to preseason. And I can't tell you the last time that has, if ever happened. If you're saying that as a Browns fan who has been there a long time, if you're optimistic, then I feel like the fan base should remain optimistic also. Oh, I think we're very optimistic. I like, I'm, I'm still like, I keep in touch with a lot of people from Cleveland and stuff. And I'm just like, wow, guys, we got and last year. Actually I did when the Browns beat the Steelers, I had a bunch of my Cleveland friends come on that are also involved in the pro wrestling business. And we did a Browns round table playoffs edition. Oh, yeah. And it was just, it's like, it's like for us who, I think it was what, 2016, we went 0 and 16 in the season, like to be five years later, optimistic towards the Super Bowl before the season even starts in five years to turn that whole thing around. Amazing. Heaven. Amazing, right? Exactly. Well, Arda, I could talk to you literally all day about sports because obviously we both have a big passion for wrestling Absolutely. and sports. But let's go ahead and wrap this up. Why don't you give everyone your social media in case they don't follow you and where they can catch you? Yeah, sure. On Twitter, it's at Arda, A-R-D-A. -A, and then Instagram is Arda Ocal TV, O-C-A-L TV. All right, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Obviously, with everything you have going on, you're always busy. And uh, we'll see you guys next time here on Talking Sass.